Salute omnes, ecosum magistra hurt. Today I'm going to share my top five strategies for teaching yourself Latin. This is going to be a juicy one because I have a lot to say about the Dowling method and how not to be deceived by cults of celebrity master Latinists. This is my second video on the Latin autodidact scene, so I'm assuming you already know what a meaningful language activity is and what it is not. If you don't know that, then check out part one here. You can also find a transcript of the whole essay that I'm reading from at my blog, link in the description. So let's begin. Incipiamos. This video is partly sponsored by AN Academy, a producer of deluxe hardcover Latin books. Use the discount code found in antiquity 5 to get 5% off your purchase and help out this channel. Choosing a core strategy. So far we have discussed examples of meaningful activity in the language, but how would you go from start to finish if you're teaching yourself the equivalent of an introductory course in Latin? What is the step-by-step -step path for a newcomer? In this section we will discuss five main archetypes representing the most successful strategies for learning Latin using the resources currently available in 2023. I chose to present five archetypes here rather than one ideal strategy because it was not possible for a single strategy to optimize all factors that Latin autodidacts find valuable. A strategy which is simple to execute makes a necessary trade-off against a strategy which provides greater variety of input. I also found that in the current market, the resources which were the lowest cost were not the most delightful. There are also strategies which may be suboptimal on some counts, but increase the user's confidence that the method will work, making them more likely to persist with the method. You can mix and match elements from different archetypes or swap strategies partway through. You can also add any meaningful input or output activity on top of the core strategies here. First strategy, bare bones or berg. This strategy is well known in the Latin subreddit r slash Latin. It's been used by a very large number of autodidacts over the years, increasing a newcomer's confidence in the method. While not without flaws, it optimizes simplicity and cost effectiveness, and can be a good place to start if you're worried about being overwhelmed with too many choices. The method is as follows. 1. Read through a chapter of Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina per se illustrata familia romana, mainly focusing on understanding the Latin and not forcing yourself to mentally translate it into your native language. Step 2. Optional but recommended. Listen to audio recordings of the textbook chapters as you go along, such as those on YouTube, the Legantibus app, or the official audio recording. Step 3. At the end of the chapter, check your understanding by completing the pensa, the exercises that are printed at the end of each chapter of Familia Romana. Step 4. If the exercises reveal gaps in your understanding, reread the current chapter or multiple earlier chapters leading up to the current chapter, and retest yourself until you're able to complete the pensa with 100% success. Step 5. Repeat for every chapter of Familia Romana. The strengths of this method are its simplicity and cost effectiveness. It only requires you to obtain one textbook, Familia Romana, which will be used for the entire duration of the beginner phase. As a side benefit, because a large number of autodidacts are already using this method or something very similar, i.e. Deluxe Orberg, it will be easy to find study groups on the Latin subreddit and the Lipsy Discord server who can learn alongside you. And yes, I pronounce it Lipsy and everyone else pronounces it as LLF. Blah, 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 blah. I can't pronounce that acronym. The drawbacks have to do with its use of PENSA as barriers to progression. Even if the PENSA involves genuine communicative output, and they don't, there is no real audience for any of the PENSA, and two of the three types of exercises are mechanical fill in the blanks. It's not output that drives acquisition, but input. Output can serve as a way to highlight gaps in understanding and offer opportunities to test hypotheses, but it does not in itself remedy those gaps in understanding. The learner has to return to processing input to fill the gaps. The PENSA mainly force people to do more rereading of previous content than they otherwise would have been inclined to endure, which increases the amount of exposure to target features, but at the cost of also increasing frustration. 
The total reliance on one textbook to provide all input in a very tidily packaged sequence of grammar is also a flaw of the method. Humans do not naturally acquire grammar in the order that it is taught in a curriculum. There is an internal sequence of grammar which defies an idealised progression of noun cases and verb tenses. We also do not process everything we read, nor acquire everything we process. Henshaw and Hawkins write in Common Ground, quote, Neither teachers nor students have total control over what will and will not be acquired. Indeed, not everything from the input becomes part of the linguistic system, at least not in an immediate and predictable manner, end quote. Striving to acquire 100% of the material in every chapter is, in a very real sense, working against our human nature. Despite these flaws, the bare-bones Orberg approach is widely used in the Latin community and offers a good starting point for anyone who wants to get into the process right away without much upfront cost. The textbook retails for about $60, although I've seen it for $30 sometimes, which might sound like a lot for a book, but for a Latin course, it is extremely reasonable, considering that you could be dropping about $1,500 US to learn Latin with group classes, or about $500 for a guided self-paced course of video lessons, a $60 textbook that you will be using for a whole year is not nearly as great an expense. Second strategy, Deluxe Orberg. Over the years, the Reddit Latin community has been growing more aware of the drawbacks of using Familia Romana as the sole source of input for the entire beginner stage. However, the community maintains a large amount of confidence and trust in the textbook as a kind of common ground touchstone resource for quote-unquote learning all the grammar and quote-unquote covering all the bases. Therefore, the subreddit has come to encourage supplementing Familia Romana with other Lipsy-branded resources keyed to its chapters. As a bonus, some of the supplemental stories are more delightful than the exposition-heavy texts in Familia Romana. The shopping list is as follows. Familia Romana. Colloquia personarum. Fabulae surae. Download the free PDF of Fabellae Latinae. Exercitia Latina pars prima. This method, paraphrased and summarized from the one currently recommended on the Latin subreddit, goes as follows. Step 1. Read through each chapter of Familia Romana and the corresponding chapter of either Colloquia Personarum for chapters 1 to 24 or Fabulae Surae for chapters 26 to 34. Also, read the corresponding story in Fabellae Latinae. Aim to read all of these at least twice. Step 2. Listen to audio recordings of the above as some of the ways that you consume this input. Step 3. Complete the pensa for every chapter and the exercitia from Exercitia Latina Pars Prima. Step 4. If you notice gaps in understanding through the pensa and exercitia, Reread the corresponding chapters until you can complete the pensa and exercitia very quickly and accurately. Step 5. Repeat for every chapter of Familia Romana. As you can see, it is basically bare-bones Orberg, but with more reading material. It retains the same drawbacks relating to the use of the pensa as barriers to progression, and the burden of having to 100% master every chapter of content in the order it is presented. I would even add that the extra emphasis on completing grammar-focused fill-in-the-blank exercises in the Exercitia is perhaps a move in the wrong direction, away from natural language acquisition through input and more towards forced output. The Exercitia are not going to harm anyone or prevent learning. They would train active recall at the cost of not being a meaningfully communicative activity and thus providing more of a red pen than a sympathetic interlocutor. It is just strange to see continual mandatory emphasis on non-communicative production tasks in a community that says it values a natural and input-based approach to language learning. While Deluxe Orberg is not as simple as Barebones Orberg, nor as cheap, it manages to increase the amount and variety of meaningful input per chapter, and thus can provide a more delightful reading experience than getting stuck rereading only the same story ten times. The backing of the Reddit community increases the learner's confidence in the method. 
It does, however, share the same flaws as Bare Bones Orberg, in that it expects the learners to be able to control what they acquire from the input, and falsely assumes that enough rereading and recall practice will always guarantee 100% acquisition of target features in any given chapter. But because so many autodidacts use Orberg's texts, there are ongoing projects to write additional stories and content that pad out every chapter of Familia Romana even further than the officially published materials, catering to a wider variety of interests. If you're a Pokemon fan, you might enjoy Mike Saradakis's Lingua Latina per Pokemon Illustrata. Seamus MacDonald is writing a sci-fi novella keyed to each chapter of Familia Romana, titled Cassandra. It is currently only available to patrons on his Patreon. There are also additional Familia Romana resources on Anthony Gibbons' website, Legonio. Doubtless, more projects keyed to Familia Romana will appear in the future due to the widespread use of the textbook. Strategy number three. The more the merrier. These next two archetypes, the more the merrier and the public domain penny pincher, are inspired in a large part by Justin Armstrong, who is documenting his process of learning Latin through mass input on his YouTube channel, and also from my observations of Latin autodidacts who are comfortable incorporating reading material from textbooks other than Familia Romana as part of their overall diet of input. The more the merrier is essentially how I have been increasing my ancient Greek proficiency after failing to achieve much fluency initially through grammar translation, and incidentally is the same method that Seamus MacDonald describes in his recent post about 2023 ancient Greek autodidact strategies. I'm confident that this strategy works even better in Latin, as there have been so many high-quality reader-style Latin textbooks published in recent years. The method is as follows. Step 1. Buy or legally download a Latin reader-based textbook. It could be Familia Romana, probably the top pick for first Latin textbook, or any other textbook which provides large amounts of input in the form of stories of greater difficulty, such as Via Latina, the Cambridge Latin course, Suburani, etc. Step 2. Read through the stories with the goal of understanding and enjoying them. Step 3. Incorporate rereading in your routine to get more value out of the stories, and to read each story at least twice. You could do the two reads one after another, or space it out and return to a previous story after reading other things. Step 4. Don't get caught up on mastering mechanical production exercises, pensa, exercitia, etc., but if you feel like doing them for a laugh, knock yourself out. Tip. The exercises in the We Are Latina textbook are a lot more interesting than most other Latin textbooks and definitely worth trying out. Step 5. If the book contains English essays on cultural topics, just skip them and focus on the Latin stories. You can briefly skim read English grammar explanations as it may increase your chances of noticing grammar features in the input, but don't stress about it either way. Step 6. When you find yourself getting stuck because the difficulty of the textbook had reached a point higher than your current reading level can handle, put this textbook aside, switch to another book series, and start again from the beginning. Step 7. When you reach a point of getting stuck with the difficulty in the new textbook, you can either start another new textbook or return to previous textbooks and continue reading them until the challenge becomes too difficult again. Step 8. When you're able to read the final chapters of all your textbooks, you're probably ready to start working your way up through intermediate reading material. Congrats, you've reached the intermediate plateau. Here are some of my most recommended Latin reader-style textbooks. Orberg's Lingua Latina per se illustrata familia romana. While I'm certainly not the biggest fan of the storyline, I often find it desperately dull, It seems to have the easiest learning curve for the early chapters. It is probably the most user-friendly place to start. Aguila and Tarrega's Via Latina, or Via Latina. A textbook does not need to be written entirely in Latin for it to provide useful input, but it is a nice feature nonetheless. Like Familia Romana, Via Latina is written entirely in Latin and uses marginal pictures to convey new words, providing lots of illustrations and in-language explanations. The exercises in We Are Latina are the most varied, interesting, and meaningful I've seen of any Latin textbook to date. 
Overall, the chapters are more dense with new material than Familiar Romana, as this course was designed to quote-unquote cover everything in a smaller volume of words. But nevertheless, this textbook is a fun read and a worthy addition. The Cambridge Latin Course This series has compelling narratives that move through a variety of genres such as ghost stories, romantic comedy, a mafia subplot in Egypt, and political intrigue. Although the glossy, colour-printed hard copies are quite expensive, currently in 2023 you can legally access all the chapter stories for free on the CSCP website in two places. If you access the stories through this first link, you can click on every word to look it up in the dictionary. In the webbook version, you can leaf through the book and read the picture captions at the start of chapters, which helps give context to the stories. The series has been used in UK classrooms for decades, so you might be able to get used copies on the cheap, especially for older editions. Suburani. Characters and continuous plot are emphasised in this relatively new textbook. It features a large quantity of colour illustrations, including many pages of essentially comic book panels continuing the main plot. How many Latin textbooks have this many richly illustrated comic book panels? The physical books of Volume 1 and 2 are quite expensive, $55 each for a total of $110. But you can get a year's digital access to both books for either $20 for North Americans or £15 for people in the UK with an individual online account. Legentibus. I would highly recommend checking out Daniel Peterson's short stories on his Legantibus app, as they are well written and delightful. If you're not in the mood to purchase a year's subscription due to the cost, it could be quite economical to buy just one month's subscription for $9.99 and binge all of his beginner level short stories at once. I also recommend checking out Justin Armstrong's optimized Latin reading list in which he suggests a reading order that roughly corresponds to a gradually increasing difficulty of comprehension with links to each resource. The More the Merrier maximizes variety and delightfulness as it provides the greatest flexibility for the user to choose textbooks and stories that appeal to them most. However, it is more expensive than other strategies, though still much less costly than taking classes or buying a self-paced video course. Having to buy a shiny new resource as the mood strikes adds some complexity to the process as you may end up spending more time shopping and searching for resources than you otherwise would have preferred. Strategy number four, the public domain penny pincher. While the more the merrier splurges on shiny new textbooks, the public domain penny pincher thriftily uses as many freely available resources as possible in their quest to acquire Latin through mass input, absolutely maximising cost effectiveness while also achieving some variety in reading material. In reality, everyone can use freely available materials on the side of whatever they're currently doing. But for people who cannot afford even a single textbook, it is valuable for us to put together a strategy that can stand up on its own while literally costing zero dollars and zero cents beyond your basic living costs and internet bills. Enter the public domain penny pincher. The method would be mostly the same as the more the merrier, except that we lack Familia Romana as an easy entry point for first textbook. I would have liked to recommend the Cambridge Latin Course online version as the go-to first text because the online reader tool allows you to instantly look up definitions, making it user-friendly for first-time readers of Latin. However, while this online textbook is still free in March 2023, I fear that it will probably be taken down in subsequent years and replaced with a subscription model, making it one day unsuitable for our penny-pinching strategy. No. In the spirit of the open source movement, a public domain penny pincher strategy ought to start with a truly public domain work, something which is and always will be free. My recommendation for first public domain textbook in this method would be one of these two, William Most's Latin by the Natural Method and Gray and Jenkins' Latin for Today. These two textbooks seem to have attracted more love and attention than the other direct method Latin textbooks in the public domain, and I can personally attest they're pretty enjoyable to read in terms of their subject matter. Most's Latin by the Natural Method 
focuses more on ecclesiastical Latin and includes retellings of Bible stories, which provides some familiar content. This is a plus if you're particularly interested in learning ecclesiastical Latin, but not a problem at all if your focus is on classical texts, as the ecclesiastical and classical dialects of Latin do not differ very significantly, especially not in the base language suitable for beginners. However, it is an annoyance that most texts does not mark macrons, which wastes the opportunity for learners to initially get used to the vowel quantities which characterise the natural rhythmic quality of the language. Gray and Jenkins' Latin for Today deals with classical subjects and contains macrons. Every story is paired with a detailed illustration, and very often the text focuses on describing and commenting on the contents of the picture. This aids in the comprehensibility of the text and grounds the language in a meaningful context. My only concern is that the stories feel rather brief, and there may not be very many repetitions of words before the next round of new words are introduced. The method is as follows. Step 1. Pick a first text. My top recommendations being either Most's Latin by the Natural Method or Gray and Jenkins' Latin for today, if and when the Cambridge Latin Course Online textbook stops being freely available. And read the stories with the intention of understanding the meaning and enjoying the story. Step 2. Incorporate rereading in your routine to get more value out of the stories. Because public domain texts have a bit of a higher learning curve than contemporary paid textbooks, you might need to aim for higher numbers of repetitions, at least three or four, but the more the better. If you can vary the activity you do in subsequent rereads, you can make rereading less monotonous. For example, on the second reread, you could focus on visualizing the scene as vividly as possible. On the third reread, you could consider miming actions to represent to the words while you read. On the fourth reread, you could consider how a dramatic voice actor might interpret the lines and reread it silently, thinking about what emotion should suit each sentence, then try reading it out loud with exaggerated emotion. Record your silly voice and play it back later as a listening activity if you want. Vary the order in which you do these rereading activities according to your mood at the time, or drop the activities entirely if they just don't make rereading more interesting. Step 3. Since we're dealing with suboptimal readings, it might be worth getting some explicit knowledge of what is happening with the grammar just to reduce confusion. Read the grammar explanations that appear alongside the stories to get an idea of what to pay attention to in the input, but don't stress about having to memorize every fact or to master each concept in the chapter it appears. Step 4. Any additional input you can get for free is going to make a significant difference to your growth and comprehension in this method. It would be beneficial to work your way through my curated YouTube playlists of beginner Latin content, which I've labeled beginner A, beginner B, intermediate A, intermediate B. Not the perfect labels, but they'll work. I've linked to them in the description here. And even consider doing some interlinear practice with texts you find very compelling. See the interlinear method below. Step 5. When you find yourself losing momentum or getting very frustrated at the difficulty level of the current readings, leave this textbook aside for now, switch to another public domain book, and start again from the beginning. Step 6. When you reach a point of getting stuck with the difficulty level in the new textbook, you can either start another new textbook or return to previous textbooks and continue reading them until the challenge becomes too difficult again. Step 7. When you're able to read the later chapters of all your textbooks, you're probably ready to start working your way up through intermediate reading material. Congrats, you've reached the intermediate plateau. Here is my list of public domain or freely available texts that are most suitable for beginners. Most's Latin by the Natural Method, Gray and Jenkins' Latin for Today, Cambridge Latin Course online version, still accessible in 2023, Maxie's Cornelia, Maxie's A New Latin Primer, Faes Carolus et Maria, Duge's Latin for Beginners, Reads Julia or Julia, Reads Camilla, Godley's The Fables of Orbilius, The Free Beginner Stories on the Legentibus app, there are a few freebies there, The Free Download of Fabellae Latinae, which is connected to the Familia Romana series, The Public Domain Novellus Sisyphus, and Cloelia Puella Romana. 
I would also strongly recommend combing your nearby libraries, especially university libraries, for copies of any more recently published reader-based textbooks. Some have managed to obtain free, and completely legal, access to Orberg's Familia Romana this way. The following public domain texts are useful rather later in the sequence, and many would be better placed as intermediate readers rather than as beginner readers. Duge's Colloquia Latina, Appleton's Pons Tironum, Sonnenskein's Ora Maritima, the second volume is Pro Patria, Vincent's A First Latin Reader, Spencer's Scalae Primae, Chambers and Robinson's Septimus, Nutting's A First Latin Reader, Nutting's Ad Alpes, this is very prominently used as an intermediate reader, Appleton and Jones's Puer Romanus, Arnold's Cothur Nullus, Bennett's Easy Latin Stories, Newman's Easy Latin Plays, Rylas's Olium, Winbolt's Dialogues for Roman Life. Check out Justin Armstrong's Latin Reading Spreadsheet for notes about his learning experience in using many of these public domain textbooks. The public domain penny pincher is the only autodidact strategy which literally costs nothing while involving no illegal activity. The value gained per dollar spent is infinite. However, the texts in this method are generally sourced from an era in which textbook authors did not prioritize writing stories to be compelling, but instead predictable. Other than the little pieces of recent freebie content like the free Legantibus stories and the CLC online stories, most of these works are not particularly delightful. The method may also demand more effort from the learner to absorb the content of each story. The difficulty curve appears a bit steeper here than in The More the Merrier because of the more restricted range of texts. These texts, like most textbooks honestly, were written with the assumption that a teacher would be guiding students through the material and supplying additional help or repetitions wherever needed, so reading them without a teacher makes them seem to breeze through the content quite quickly. A public domain penny pincher may need to rely more on rereading and deliberate learning strategies such as sentence flashcards to absorb the content than someone using more modern texts with built-in repetitions across longer stories. The method is a bit more complex than simply opening up Familia Romana and going from there. It can be inconvenient to rely on reading PDFs and scanned books from archive.org, as you'll be mostly reading from a computer screen. And no, you can't print them out. Printing costs money. <laughs> this is a public domain penny pincher zero dollar strategy. There's that feeling of having lots of tabs open in your browser, which makes me feel like there are lots of tabs open in my mind. While public domain penny pinching may be more awkward than other methods, it is completely free and can be readily combined with any other strategy without adding any additional expense to that method. But if you are willing to spend money on old school public domain Latin textbooks, there is a recent paperback reprint of Latin for Today on Amazon, link in the description. And if you're interested in deluxe hardcover Latin books, check out AN Academy's Latin Library, which stocks many of these titles, including Latin for Today. Use the discount code found in Antiquity 5 to get 5% off your purchase and to help out this channel. Strategy 5. Strange Bedfellows. What happens when you take a grammar translation book such as Wheelock's Latin and study it alongside an input-rich graded reader like Familia Romana. The love child of such a union is the strategy I will call Strange Bedfellows. It is very difficult to get people to trust that they can safely let go of explicit grammar study. I can point to examples of how ordinary people growing up in multilingual parts of the world find their greatest success at learning languages through meaningful communication, how professional applied linguists learn very complex indigenous languages using input, how the traditional school system, which emphasizes explicit learning, seems to have the worst success rate of any language teaching institution in terms of producing people who actually use those languages. But I cannot change the fact that most people who grew up in modern Western schooling are deeply enculturated with the idea that explicit grammar study is essential to the language learning process. On the other hand, it is very much easier to convince people that input is beneficial. 
Most people will already have a very positive attitude towards extensive reading for increasing reading proficiency, and are willing to give it a try. Saying no to grammar for them is a harder sell than saying yes to input, so why not just say yes to both? I've seen many people using some form of strange bedfellows to learn Latin. It is an extremely common strategy in the community. People who use it say that they are getting, quote-unquote, the best of both worlds, and, quote-unquote, covering all their bases, which gives them confidence. They would ask, why do you have to pick a side? No matter who truly wins the debate over the sufficiency of input, the learner who incorporates strange bedfellows has hedged their bets so as not to miss out on either of the potential benefits of input or grammar study. The exact text chosen can vary depending on the tastes of the learner. Here are some possible pairings. Wheelock's Latin and Familia Romana, a classic pair for North American learners, as these two texts are available quite cheaply and are both widely used. If Wheelock's is being used, however, I would also recommend purchasing the reader supplement keyed to each chapter of Wheelock's 38 Latin Stories by Groton and May. Those 38 stories are not enough input by themselves to replace the need for at least one other graded reader textbook, but they are a nice addition to have alongside Wheelock's chapters. Familia Romana and Latina Disco, Student's Manual. The student manual Latina Disco is essentially an English explanation of all the grammar in each chapter of Familia Romana. It lacks those isolated grammar jewels that help put the explicit in explicit learning, but the advantage of choosing this pairing is that a large amount of reading can be keyed to each grammar topic explained in Latina Disco, not just the base chapters in Familia Romana, but also all the supplements discussed above in the strategy titled Deluxe Orberg. Next, most reader-style textbooks other than the fully Latin Familia Romana and We Are Latina already have English grammar explanations paired with each chapter of content, and often come with corresponding grammar drills. Examples include the Cambridge Latin course, the Oxford Latin course, Suburani, Eke Romani, etc. You could simply purchase one textbook series and pair those readings with their corresponding grammar explanations. If you once learnt or failed Latin in school through a grammar book, and you have fond memories of that book, you could return to that nostalgic tome and pair it with any reader-based book from the list supplied in The More the Merrier. The method has two sub-variants, grammar first and reading first. The difference is primarily sequencing and not substance. In the grammar first method, step one, start reading a chapter from the grammar-based textbook. It will start introducing a new grammar topic with a chart and an explanation. Step two, once you've understood the explanation, do the little drill exercises accompanying it to confirm that you've understood the isolated feature in single words, and if you want, read and understand the longer sentences too. Step three, now switch to reading a story from your reading-based textbook, focusing first on reading for pleasure and understanding. Step four, reread the story and carefully notice when and where the target grammar feature occurs in the story to see how it is used in the context. If the story does not feature that topic right away, you can look forward to it appearing in a later story. Step five, repeat for the next grammar topic and chapter of each book until you finish both courses. Step six, if your reading proficiency is still not as high as you want it to be at the end of the course, Read several more beginner reader-based textbooks for pleasure until you reach intermediate proficiency. In the reading first method, start reading a chapter from a readings-based textbook, focusing initially on reading for pleasure and understanding. Step two, switch to reading a chapter from your grammar book. It will introduce a new grammar topic with a chart and an explanation. Step three, once you've understood the explanation, do the little drill exercises accompanying it to confirm that you've understood the isolated feature in single words, and if you want, read and understand the longer sentences too. Step four, now return to the story you read initially, reread it, and notice if you can find any examples of the grammar topic occurring in the story. If the story does not feature that topic, look forward to it appearing in a later story. Step five, repeat for the next chapter and grammar topic of each book 
until you finish both courses. Step six, if your reading proficiency is not as high as you want it to be at the end of the course, read several more beginner reader-based textbooks for pleasure until you reach intermediate proficiency. Strange Bedfellows allows the learner to integrate explicit grammar study not just alongside, but also within the act of reading stories. This can help the learner understand grammar more deeply and in context, but it can also distort the reading experience if it becomes the only goal in reading a story. We must not lose sight of the underlying communicative purpose of texts, particularly when analysing authentic texts. Cicero did not write in Catilinam to provide examples of uses of the subjunctive. Caesar did not write his Gallic Wars to test students with ablative absolutes or accusative infinitive in direct speech. Making sure that you approach texts with the intent to grapple with their meaning and not just their form in your reading practice is a way to prevent this deadening effect, which is why I strongly recommend reading stories for pleasure before analysing their use of the language. While Strange Bedfellows is not without its flaws, it provides a kind of safety net for learners who lack confidence in the sufficiency of input. When their brains refuse to acquire a seemingly basic feature of grammar in the chapter it's introduced, they don't need to get worried or to accept on faith that natural acquisition is outside our conscious control and it will all work out in the end. They can simply memorise the feature through the grammar method and move on with consuming more input. The task of learning explicit grammar rules, however, does come at the cost of spending valuable learning time not doing as much meaningful activity in the language itself. Progress towards true reading proficiency will thus be a bit slower with strange bedfellows than with a purely input-based strategy but that might not matter. If this learner finds explicit grammar study delightful because of their personal tastes, sacrificing some time to do what they enjoy doing anyway is not a big deal. What about the interlinear method? I didn't include the interlinear method in my list of five main archetypes because I believe it works better today as a supplemental activity or as an intermediate reading strategy than as a core method to start from scratch. The method is as follows. Step one, choose a text of great joy for you that exists in both Latin and your native language, such as your favorite telling of a myth, your favorite Bible passage, or something nerdy like Harry Potter. Step two, read the first sentence in the Latin version and use a combination of the translation and a dictionary or a literal interlinear translation to arrive at an understanding of both what the whole sentence means and what every word in it means. Step three, reread that sentence in Latin, thinking about the meaning. Step four, repeat for every subsequent sentence in the text, aiming to become more and more absorbed in the Latin text and less and less dependent on reading the translated text. Step five, ideally you will move towards simply reading the Latin and occasionally checking the translation when unsure of a word. While in the 19th century, James Hamilton promoted this as a viable way to start from scratch in Latin, and it is also similar to how C.S. Lewis learned to think in ancient Greek, this is a much more frustrating place to start from than using graded reading material because of the huge number of new words and features it introduces all at once. Once you're nearing the end of the beginner phase, however, interlinear reading can be very compelling if you choose a text that you greatly enjoy. It's a good idea to choose something that you have already read completely in your native language because you'll know for sure if it's worth reading again, and you'll remember what happens as you proceed through the text. Many Latinists report great improvements in reading fluency from reading Harius Potter, Justin Slocum Bailey describes how the books opened him up to reading extensively in Latin. I also found great gains in reading fluency from reading the two available Latin translations, Philosophy Lapis and Camera Secretorum. But it made a big difference that I was a huge Harry Potter nerd in my childhood and had read all the books several times in English. Find your passion and see if there is a Latin text of it somewhere. 
that would make a great text to read with the interlinear method. What about the Dowling method? This is where I put my foot down firmly and say that the Dowling method is not worth our time. The method is as follows. Step one, read an English explanation of all the basic grammar rules in Latin. Step two, memorize all the noun, adjective, and verb tables from Wheelock's Latin, a total of 857 forms, and write them out 200 times from memory. Step three, do the bare bones Orberg method. The Ranieri Dowling variant adds some irregular forms to the total number of forms, incorporates listening, and only obligates the learner to write out everything a hundred times from memory. But it does not alter the fact that hundreds of forms must be memorized and written hundreds of times before attempting any meaningful activity in the language. This method is not worth the substantial time it takes away from meaningful language activity. I am not dogmatically opposed to memorizing paradigms, but even in the grammar translation method, you're supposed to space them out and vary the activities. Doing literally all the brute memorization in one single chunk, writing out a total of 171,400 words from memory, requires such an abnormal level of diligence and stubbornness that even some of the most hardened grammar teachers wouldn't bother fighting their students to make them do it. And that is precisely how the Dowling method propagates itself. The Dowling method is a manifestation of a social pattern I will call a diligence trap. Diligence traps. You do not need exceptionally high diligence to learn a language if the method you are using is effective. The normal level of diligence required to learn a language is simply this. Show up and be mentally present. If you can show up on most days to do at least half an hour of meaningful activity in the language and be mentally present while doing those activities, after a year you will see significant results. What causes people to stop learning language is not usually that the method itself doesn't work, because everything works, but because they lost the spark of internal motivation to continue, so they stopped showing up or stopped being meaningfully engaged in language activities. Sometimes we just feel low in our mood and need some diligence to keep persisting until the mood passes. But continual demotivation is a symptom of a deeper problem. What has caused you to lose the spark? Is it because you have been forcing yourself to do increasingly frustrating activities with no communicative purpose? Is it because you need to change activities up and add more variety? Possessing a normal level of diligence and getting naturally frustrated at futile activities is healthy because this is how your brain tells you to stop doing useless things and to do more interesting things. Just as a person who lacks the ability to feel pain is more likely to physically injure themselves, a person who does not respond to frustrating situations appropriately is more likely to persist in futile activity. The optimal level of diligence is to have just enough grit to persist through temporary setbacks or short periods of low mood, but not enough to allow you to ignore the warning signs of something fundamentally going wrong. Diligence traps do not work for people who possess these healthy levels of diligence. They prey on exceptionally diligent people, while rapidly filtering out everyone else from persisting with the method. Indeed, the faster the method can cause people to drop out, the better it will maintain an illusion of effectiveness. When a highly unpleasant activity happens very early in the method, the non-targeted people will quit the method so fast that few people will have noticed that they even started it. Ideally, they should quit even before trying, by reading the method and deciding that it is too demanding for them to attempt. For example, the big filter step in the Dowling method, writing 857 forms from memory 200 times, happens almost immediately. Anyone who can actually be persuaded to get past the big memorization step of the Dowling method is therefore heavily preselected to have diligence well in excess of what is necessary to learn a language. With that level of stubbornness and commitment, 
they are highly likely to succeed with any language learning method, good or bad. So the only people you will notice taking the Dowling method seriously will be those exceptionally diligent people who are brilliant at everything they do, making it appear that the method is more effective than it actually is. Some of these exceptionally diligent people will then go on to put just as much energy into every other part of their language learning journey, making them predisposed to become very high-level speakers and influential members of the community. The people who get filtered out by the diligence trap, by contrast, usually have more modest ambitions. There is also a very strong incentive for promoters of the diligence trap to insist that the hard steps are absolutely necessary and must not be skipped. When they were using the method, they somehow had to convince themselves to keep going through the hard parts. They had to fervently believe against rational frustration that they should not abandon the strategy or try alternative paths. Now they want to tell everyone that you just need to work hard and keep pushing through the hard parts like they did, for if it turned out that all that hard work was actually a massive waste of time, they would look like a fool for having done it. They are therefore highly invested in telling everyone that there are no shortcuts and certain unpleasant steps, the ones they did, must be completed for true mastery. While the Dowling method is a pretty extreme example of a diligence trap, I have a suspicion that something similar is at play in both the Bare Bones Orberg and Deluxe Orberg methods. Namely, the Reddit community's insistence that the Pensa and Exerkitia must be perfected before you are allowed to progress to the next chapter of Familia Romana. These exercises demand perfect production of all the grammar features up to that point, which is not how we acquire languages. Humans do not naturally absorb grammar features in the order they are artificially presented in textbooks, nor do we acquire everything we read shortly after we read it. But everyone who knuckled down and forced themselves to reread a chapter for the tenth time just to tick that box of passing the pencil by brute force had to convince themselves that it was worth all the frustration. After completing the pencil, they can look back on their hard work and tell everyone that it was necessary and there are no shortcuts. To say it otherwise would devalue their hard work. I've noticed herd thinning patterns similar to the diligence trap happening in schools that teach Latin via the grammar translation method. The filtering starts when the Latin teacher brags about how challenging their subject is, and about how it's only the best of the best, or only the most hardworking, who succeed. Of those who take the class, The middle to low achieving students, especially students with special learning needs, are filtered out from year to year as their grades and school advisors tell them they are unsuitable for taking such an academically rigorous subject. The most senior Latin teacher ends up teaching a tiny year 12 class of extremely diligent students. These students are the kind that ace all their other subjects, play musical instruments, become school captains, and are very pleasant to teach. Because the herd has been thinned to only include the absolute brightest and most highly motivated, that remaining group of students strives to do well, no matter how effective or otherwise the senior Latin teacher's pedagogy is. Meanwhile, the Latin teacher thinks that he or she has done a great job because of all their high scores. The patterns of diligence traps may also manifest around celebrity figures and authorities. The more I read of Reginald Foster's Latin teaching advice, the more red flags I see, and the more I wonder if the teaching advice that he gave was really good on its own merits, or if the abrasive difficulty of what he was demanding of his students caused only the keenest ones to stay with him, and he certainly attracted keen students to him. For example, his choice of day one reading material was hexameter poetry from Virgil's second eclogue. Torva leaina lupum sequitur, lupus ipse capellam. I won't read out the rest of it, but it's a paragraph of Latin hexameter poetry for day one reading. All the texts he used with beginners were similarly selected from difficult authors with no attempt made to give easier texts earlier and harder ones later. The texts were not altered to increase comprehensibility. In his words, quote from the Osser book, They have not been doctored or manipulated, or we hate to use the word, dumbed down, end quote. There were no glosses, whether marginal or interlinear. The student needed to search for every new word in the dictionary and read the full dictionary entry to find the meaning which applied in this context. 
He even claims that if his photocopied Latin readings were hard to read because of the worn, blotted, or error-laden state of the book they were photocopied from, that this was an advantage because it provided, quote, from his officer book, opportunity for students to learn how to read these texts as they exist in the library, end quote. The man would not back down on even the most trivial detail that would make passages more readable for his students, i.e. the image quality of his photocopies. He also made his students sign an academic contract at the commencement of his course. And side note, academic contracts, totally fine. It's just the content of this particular one that is uh, worthy of comment in which they agreed that they could only study Latin with him under the condition that they received no help or guidance from any Latin tutor or other Latin resource. I quote, I, the undersigned party of this academic contract, have maturely determined to study and progressively to master the Latin language and Latin literature in the Foster Experiences, only if I am totally free in my decision to dedicate myself to Latin according to the particular method and system presented in class, only if I carefully complete my own personal projects, both inside and outside the classroom, with no external assistance, guidance, or counselling, which prove to be useless and harmful. Only if I refuse all sorts of foolish joint study arrangements group consultations, copying sessions with others, as well as aids from external texts, tutors, or books, end quote. Thou shalt have no other tutors before me, it seems. I've never seen another Latin teacher forbid his or her students from hiring a tutor or reading language learning books. But perhaps I'm oversensitive in noticing cult-like behaviour because I was raised in a cult which forbade everyone from reading any Christian books outside of the Bible and what the cult published, so we would be kept in the dark about true Christianity. Foster could have simply meant, don't cheat on your homework or do your own work, but making students sign a contract stating for them that external guidance or counselling or tutoring of any kind would prove to be useless and harmful, seems to be demanding unquestioning adherence to everything Foster says. However, in defence of Foster, it is possible that his in-person teaching did not match what he conveyed in his book Ossa Latinitatis, The book gives the impression that from scratch beginners should receive no support from anything likely to be helpful, for example, glosses, graded readers, or tiered reader adaptations. But Foster himself provided verbal support in his classes. A book describing his method cannot accurately convey how much spontaneous verbal support he gave. This obscures how much his in-person teaching and in-person charisma made up for the lack of resources he permitted to his students. And although the book is written as if students using the Foster experiences ought to start from scratch purely with Foster's method and use nothing else, it appears that it was common for Foster's students to come to him after studying Latin elsewhere, further obscuring how his Ossa method performs for ordinary beginners. The problem is that people quote his opinions as authority. I saw this one in March. Reggie Foster was fond of saying, All you need is the text and a dictionary. If any teacher other than Foster had said that, you would think that they were being deliberately unhelpful to their students. Diligence traps are not just language learning methods with minor flaws. They are methods that gain high fanatical praise because of their very worst parts. They still work, of course, if you're from the target demographic that has exceptional diligence and commitment. But just because it is possible to succeed with them, that doesn't make them good learning methods. My teacher colleague Christine Wang summed it up well. We can do hard things, but we don't have to do things the hardest way. Here are some of the red flags which may point towards a language learning strategy being a diligence trap. It demands that learners persist with an activity which is likely to cause most ordinary humans to give up especially in the early stages. Supporters express the following sentiments. This cannot be skipped. There are no shortcuts. You cannot become a true master unless. You will not really know Latin unless. Followed by the description of the most objectionable part of the strategy. 
It is emphasised that the strategy must be credible because a celebrated master Latinist devised it. Bonus points if the technique takes on the name of the celebrity and if there is a personality cult surrounding that authority figure. See the examples of the Dowling Method, devised by Professor William C. Dowling of Rutgers University, or the Orberg Method, devised by Hans Orberg, who can do no wrong, or the Foster Experiences, devised by Reggie Foster, the Pope's Latinist of 40 years. It attracts very positive sentiment in reviews, which conflicts sharply with the sentiment it gives you from actually using the method. The benefits of the method are loudly hyped up, and any criticism is dismissed as pushing a grammar translation agenda. On those last points, it is difficult to tell a diligence trap from a genuinely good language learning method on the basis of public sentiment, because it will attract very positive reviews from loyal fans. Among those reviews, there will be much ink spilled in saying how it is so much superior to the grammar translation method, language pedagogy's favourite bogeyman. Unfortunately, a person's loud criticism of the grammar translation method is no guarantee that he or she is actually promoting a communicative approach. We need to evaluate learning methods on the basis of their actual substance and not on their ideological opposition to grammar translation. Otherwise, our community's tendency to simplify the complex history of language pedagogy into a binary conflict between us, the good guys, and grammar translation, the bad guys, makes us all too easy to deceive. Conclusions Sometimes we seek answers to the wrong questions about how to learn a language. Instead of asking, how can I bear through long and unpleasant tasks with grit and determination, we should ask, how can I spend most of my time doing meaningful activities that are inherently enjoyable? Instead of asking, how can I pre-train myself for speaking by doing solo practice activities, we should ask, how can I use my current level of skill to interact meaningfully with real humans? Instead of asking, if Duolingo is not well regarded, what app do you recommend to learn Latin? As if there has to be a specific app to solve our problem. We should ask, what kinds of activities constitute meaningful engagement in the language, and how well are they facilitated by phones, books, or people? An activity is communicative if it compels you to interpret or express meaning, or both. If you can easily answer the two questions, what information is being conveyed and what will the audience do with the information, then it is the kind of activity which requires you to focus on how language conveys meaning, enabling your brain to make form-meaning connections. Anything which does not connect form with meaning, but simply drills forms, will require you to do the same work again in a meaningful application later. Non-communicative activities are thus inherently less efficient use of your time than communicative activities, where form and meaning are constantly integrated. The Latin community needs to be sceptical about bold claims of effectiveness for any non-communicative activity. Just because a master Latinist says this is a good idea, or there is a community of very diligent people who say it works for them, does not mean that it is necessarily more effective than a placebo. In medical research, a healthy adherer bias has been observed in randomized control trials where patients who diligently persist with taking their placebo pills have a lower mortality than those who stop taking their placebos. That doesn't mean continuing to take placebos reduces mortality, but it reveals the dangers of relying on studies that focus on the people who successfully carry out instructions given by authorities, people with greater than normal diligence. Ignoring the outcomes of people who stop adhering to a regimen creates a survivorship bias. We also need to acknowledge that While Familia Romana is very helpful for autodidacts, not every beginner must read it as their only or main source of input. Orberg is not the beginning and end of all communicative language learning. Any meaningful activity paired with any level-appropriate Latin text can be a source of valuable input for language learners. In the end, 
all beginner paths will converge on the intermediate plateau, a stage where incremental progression slows down as the learner moves from sheltered textbook vocabulary to a far larger pool of much rarer vocabulary found in authentic texts. An autodidact will spend far more time in the intermediate plateau than in the beginner stage leading up to that plateau. How they got to the plateau matters less and less the longer they keep learning at intermediate and advanced levels, so we should not be too concerned about learners taking a slightly less than optimal path through beginner material if they're enjoying themselves along the way. As a final note, if you're looking for extensive reading material which is geared towards learners in the intermediate plateau, you might enjoy my upcoming book, The Lover's Curse, a tiered reader of Aeneid IV. This contains 30,000 words of tiered readings for Virgil's fourth book of the Aeneid, the one that narrates the tragedy of Queen Dido. By providing easier Latin texts that explain what happens in gradually more difficult language, we can make Virgil's beautiful poetry comprehensible. It's currently in the final editing stage, and I'll be releasing free digital copies of it upon publication to anyone who signs up to my Latin email newsletter. Share in the comments if any of these strategies resonate with your experiences. Are you a strange bedfellows user? Good on you, we can be friends even if we don't agree on everything. Have you tried reading through any of the reader textbooks I've mentioned here? Let us know in the comments how that went. Please stay away from personality cults and be safe. Walete omnes. Ami, odier, odier, non dum bene, non rum. Ami, ester, ester, non yam.